kinetics is the study of the speed of a reaction, how fast the reaction actually occurs. Thermodynamics, covered earlier, is a study of will a reaction happen or not. But kinetics is not whether it will happen, but when will it happen. Some reactions can be very fast, such as the reaction with copper sulfate and ammonia. Instant reaction causing it to go from the light blue color to the dark blue color. Other reactions are a little more slow. It takes some amount of time for the reaction to fully develop. As the light blue color is slowly progressing into the uh, golden, almost pumpkin pie looking solution. And the kinetics of these reactions play an important role in chemistry of when a reaction will occur. Kinetics is the study of the speed of a reaction or the timing. How long will it take to go from reactants into products? So thermodynamics covered a little earlier studies if a reaction is possible or if a reaction can happen. Can you mix a couple of compounds together and will it form uh, a product? Will a chemical reaction occur? Kinetics is based on the timing, not if a reaction occur will occur, but when will a reaction occur? And these two different uh, studies of thermodynamics and kinetics play an important role in how chemistry happens and determines what types of products you end up with in a chemical reaction. Kinetics are not something that can be uh, just determined based on the chemical reaction itself, just based on looking at the energies uh, of the different reactants. You have to actually measure the time and measure the different rates of the reaction. In kinetics, there are two terms that are used a lot, the rate or the reaction rate and the reaction time. And these two terms are inversely related. That is the rate is equal to about one over the reaction time. As the rate increases, there's a higher rate of reaction, a faster rate. That means the overall reaction time is going to decrease. Um, the same thing would be true if it's a very low rate. If the rate of the reaction is very small, that means few reactions are happening over time, and therefore the time it takes for the overall reaction to happen will increase. While many times in, uh, in the math of chemistry, looking at the chemical reactions, the rate is what would be used. That's not something that can be directly measured. But time is something that can be measured. And in labs and in experiments, you're measuring a reaction time, how long it takes to go from reactants to products, and then using this proportionality to convert that into the reaction rate itself. The rate of a chemical reaction is very much dependent on the concentration. Even a slight change in concentration can change the rate of a reaction drastically, depending on how, um, depending on the rate law and how the concentration um, is related. So typically you have reactions going from reactants into products, reactants into products. The rate law is the mathematical equation that relates concentration 
to the rate and therefore to the time of a reaction. So the rate is equal to some rate constant, which would be unique for each individual reaction, times the concentration of each reactant. The kinetics and the rate of an equation is not dependent on the overall products, but it's dependent on the concentrations of just the reactants. So it's the rate, uh, the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the reactants, and these reactants are raised to some power. And that's not from the balanced chemical equation. These exponents, um, these powers, are the reaction orders of the particular reaction. The specifics of how the concentration will change and affect the rate. So a reaction order is uh, something that truly affects the rate, the nitty gritty of how changing the rate, or I'm sorry, how changing the concentration will specifically affect the rate itself and the, therefore the time. In many cases, if you double the concentration of something, you will double the reaction rate, that the reaction rate will increase by a factor of two, and that means the time will decrease by a factor of two, because if you have a high rate, the overall reaction time is small. In other cases, if you double the concentration of something, the, the rate will increase by four times. It will happen four times as fast, and the reaction time will be cut down to only a quarter. And there are even cases where uh, it's not related to the concentration. This would be a zeroth order reaction. So each of these uh, different reaction orders is different based on the concentration or based on uh, the different reactant. Many times you can, in chemical equations, there are multiple different reactants and each one of them may have a different reaction order. Reaction orders are specific to each different reactant. To check the reaction order, you can change the concentration simply either by cutting the concentration of one component in half or by doubling that concentration. In this reaction of sucrose and potassium permanganate, the sucrose concentration was cut in half. The dark purple permanganate still instantly reacts to form the green manganate ion. However, the timing of the second step of the reaction is now increased, approximately doubling the reaction time. By cutting the concentration of sucrose in half, the reaction time doubled, indicating the re the reaction rate was also cut in half. This would mean that in this second step of the reaction, sucrose is a first order reaction, and in the first part, it is a zeroth order reaction, as there is no change in timing based on the concentration. How the concentration affects the timing of a reaction is referred to as the reaction order. Some reactions, if doubling the concentration, will cut the reaction time in half, thereby doubling the rate. This would be a first order reaction. Second order reactions, when doubling the concentration, would cut the time to one quarter increasing the rate by four. 
there are also zeroth order reactions that are not dependent on concentration. In this two-step reaction of potassium permanganate with sucrose or table sugar, the intense purple color of the potassium permanganate instantly goes to a dark green color. Then, in the second step of the reaction, the slower reaction with a slower rate changes it into the gold color. Based on that video experiment, you're look or that video, you're looking to see how the change in concentration changes the overall time of a reaction, and the overall time is related to the overall rate. Most times, these are the three reaction orders that a lot of uh, reactions would undergo, where you can either have a zeroth order reaction. This would be one where it is independent of the concentration. So in a zeroth order reaction, that means it's the concentration raised to the power of zero, and anything raised to the power of zero is just one. So if you double that concentration, it's still raised to the zero power and it's still going to be one. So it does not affect the rate at all. The rate itself in these reactions would be equal to the rate constant. Other reactions in first order reactions, you have the concentration raised to the power of one. And this means that doubling the concentration or increasing the concentration will increase the rate by that same factor. So in the case of doubling the concentration, if you double the concentration, it's two to the power of one, so two itself, you double the concentration and therefore the rate is doubled as well. This is a first order reaction. And the, the last of the ones that we'll really look at is a second order reaction. And these are reactions where the concentration and rate is based on a, uh, the concentration raised to the second power. So it's the concentration squared. And that means if you were to increase the concentration, the rate itself would increase by that factor squared. So a uh, simple case is to double the reaction or double the concentration. And when you do that, you're squaring that factor of two, which will lead to a factor of four, two squared. And overall, the rate would then increase by four times, and the reaction time would decrease by four times. There are other reaction orders. These can keep going on for a number of times, uh, third order, fourth order reactions. But in uh, experiments like this one and in this level of chemistry, these are really the only three that would be um, focused on in, uh, in class and things. So I would mentioned earlier that uh, the kinetics is important, looking at, and the thermodynamics, they're tied together in how the reactions happen. Many times there are a lot of different uh, reactions that have two outcomes or more than two outcomes, but which products are favored and which products will actually form, these can vary. And there are two different types of products that you can see. There can be either the kinetic product, the one that happens the fastest and the easiest, and the thermodynamic proper, uh, product. This would be the one where in the end, 
overall, it's the most stable product. So in this uh, reaction, uh, reaction scheme that I have here, the energy needed for the reaction to get to product A, this first red line, is very small. It does not need a lot of reaction, or I'm sorry, a, a lot of energy to go through this reaction. And in the end, the product is at a lower energy than the reactant, so yes, that can happen. That, and that would happen fast. There is a low activation energy. However, the other line, this blue line of reaction B, you're starting off with the same reactants. There's a really high activation energy, but overall, the energy of the products is lower. There is less energy associated with these products right here. So this is the one that would happen if there was infinite time. This is the thermodynamic product. Uh, given infinite time, this reaction will always go towards reaction B. However, in the short term, reaction A would be the one that would happen at least first because it has the lower activ <clears throat> activation energy. And knowing the difference between these two types of products can play a role in chemistry and figuring out if you want to push a reaction to one or the other, you need to know what the activation energy is, what the end energy is, and which of these products would either be uh, favored by kinetics or favored by thermodynamics. As mentioned, kinetics is the study of the speed of a reaction, the rate at which the reaction happens. Many times there can be multiple reactions that uh, can occur. Different reactants can combine and form one product or another. Some reactions happen very, very fast. Others happen very, very slow. And the difference between them is how thermodynamics and kinetics are related. Something that does not take a lot of energy, it's easy to undergo, but overall the end product is a little uh, not very favored, that would be the kinetic product. It's something that, yes, it can occur and it's really easy to get to. The thermodynamic product, product many times is the one that has the lowest possible energy. You're looking at the uh, products that have the lowest amount of energy where it might take a little bit of extra energy, a little bit of oomph for it to actually go from the reactants to the products, but overall in the end, it will happen. It will get to that lower energy level product. That's the thermodynamic product. But that activation energy, that energy that it takes to get to those final products is dependent on the kinetics, or that's what the kinetics is based off. Overall, if a reaction will happen is based on the thermodynamics, but when a reaction happens is based on the kinetics. In the experiment itself in lab, you're going to be looking at the kinetics of two different reactions. In the first reaction, you're looking at the kinetics of permanganate reduction by sucrose. This is going to be happening in a basic solution. The reduction of permanganate happens in two steps. So there are two different reactions that occur one after the other. The first step, the permanganate ion MnO4 minus gains one electron and is reduced to form the manganate ion, MnO4 two minus. And this reaction happens pretty fast. Uh, the second reaction is much slower. 
And in that reaction, the manganate ion is reduced further and gains two more electrons to form manganese dioxide. Each of these three different forms, permanganate, manganate, and manganese dioxide, all display a different color. And you can look at those colors and see which uh, reaction is occurring and measure the time it takes for those colors to appear. The first step of the reaction is, again, this very, very fast step. It under most conditions, it will occur almost instantly. The purple or pink permanganate gains that one electron to become the manganate ion. This is uh, has a formal charge of six plus and it's a blue green uh, solution. The second step is much slower. And this is where that blue green solution of permanganate picks up two electrons under basic conditions and forms the manganese dioxide. And that appears as a kind of a brownish golden color uh, dispersed through the solution. Now, because this first step happens so fast, that's the one you'll be looking at second. This second step, the reduction of manganate to manganese dioxide, that's the one you'll look at first. And then you're going to be performing some dilutions to lower the concentration and slow the, all of the reactions down. And once those concentrations are lowered, then you'd be able to measure this uh, first step of the reaction. But at the uh, in the provided solutions in lab, just mixing those together, this first one's way too fast. So you'll be looking at the second step first and the first step second. I hope that's not too confusing. Both of these uh, reactions do occur by the oxidation of sucrose. These are two reduction reactions. So in each case, the permanganate is gaining an electron and then the manganate gains two electrons. Those electrons are coming from the sucrose molecule. And while you're not going to be looking at this further, uh, this is the oxidation of these groupings right here on the sucrose molecule. Initially, the carbon has an oxygen oxidation state of minus one and at the end has an oxidation state of plus three. So it loses four electrons from each one of these groupings. So for every one sucrose, it has the potential of losing up to 12 electrons. So in the lab itself, as I mentioned, you're looking at that second step first, the manganate being reduced to manganese dioxide. So reducing the concentration uh, by a specific amount or a set factor is much easier uh, to perform in a lab than increasing the concentration by that set factor. By di uh, diluting it, you just, these are all uh, happening in solution. You measure out the known volume of solution, a known volume of water and can di uh, dilute it very easily. Uh, so that's why this, uh, the first step will be looked at second. So in this first part, you're looking at the second step, the manganate being reduced reduced to the manganese dioxide. And what you'll be doing is taking 10 milliliters of the potassium permanganate solution, 50 milliliters of the sucrose solution, combining those together um, and just recording when does that green color change into the golden color and you're recording that reaction time. Then you're going to look individually 
at lowering the concentration of one but not the other. So you could lower the concentration of the potassium permanganate by a set factor. You can cut the concentration in half, taking five milliliters of the potassium permanganate and five milliliters of water, and you would mix those together first. You're doing the dilution first before combining the two different components of the reaction. So you do the dilution first, then still add 50 mils of sucrose and record the reaction time. By comparing that initial reaction to the reaction time with a lowered permanganate concentration, but the sucrose concentration remains the same, you can determine the reaction order of the manganate ion. All through this one, you're assuming that everything, because this is the second step, all of that permanganate has already turned into the manganate ion. So you're looking at uh, determining the reaction order of the manganate ion based on this. The third uh, reaction or third combination in this is keeping that potassium permanganate concentration the same, so still using 10 milliliters, but now cutting the concentration of the sucrose in half. You would use 25 milliliters of the sucrose solution and 25 milliliters of water. Mix those to the flask first, again, performing any sort of dilutions before combining the two different materials. And last, add uh, the 10 milliliters of potassium permanganate and record what that reaction time is. By comparing this reaction to that first one, you can then get the reaction order of the sucrose, the one component that's changing. The concentration of sucrose is changing and the permanganate or manganate is remaining the same. So looking at these, you can get the reaction order of both the sucrose and the uh, manganate ion. And you really could take those reaction orders, look at each of these reaction times, determine what the rate would be. Remember the rate is the inverse of the time. So one divided by the time is equal to the rate. And you really could solve for the, re, uh, the rate constant for this particular uh, equation. Once you have the uh, second step of the reaction kind of looked at and you've looked at those reaction orders, then you're going to be diluting these solutions by quite a bit um, in order to look at that very, very fast first step. So you're going to be performing the same reactions using the same volumes and the same solutions, the potassium permanganate and the sucrose just at much lower concentrations, a 10 times dilution factor for each of them. So by lowering those concentrations, you're slowing down the reaction and increasing that reaction time so that it's something you can actually measure in the lab. So you're going to be preparing these diluted solutions from the provided uh, solutions themselves. So for a 10 times solution of the potassium permanganate, you'll be taking five milliliters of the given solution and adding 45 milliliters of water. Now you have 50 milliliters of a dilute potassium permanganate solution. You'll also prepare 200 milliliters of a 10 times dilution of sucrose. 20 milliliters of the sucrose solution and 180 milliliters of water in a beaker. Now you would have 200 milliliters of a much lower concentration sucrose and 50 milliliters of a much lower concentration potassium permanganate. And you'll go through and perform those three reactions again. 10 milliliters of this potassium permanganate solution and 50 milliliters of this 
sucrose solution and record the reaction time. You're looking at the first reaction step. So you're looking at the color change going from that pinkish purple color into that teal green type of color. You're measuring how long it takes for that color change to occur. You'll then selectively lower even further the two concentrations of either just the potassium permanganate or just the sucrose. And from these three time measurements, you're able to get the reaction order of the permanganate and the sucrose for this first reaction step. And you can see this uh, fast then slow, uh, these two reactions for the reduction of permanganate all the way down to manganese dioxide through the oxidation of sucrose in basic conditions. The next reaction that you're going to be looking at in the lab is the kinetics of the iodine clock. And this is again a redox reaction. It's uh, the iodate ion is being reduced to molecular iodine by the oxidation of bisulfite. So iodate IO3 minus is going all the way down to I2 minus. It's uh, picking up five electrons each, and the bisulfite is uh, losing two electrons to become the sulfate ion. So overall, you have uh, this balanced uh, reduction and this balanced oxidation for these two half reactions. And combining them, you would get the overall reaction for this uh, iodine clock. Five bisulfite plus two iodate will give two iodine plus five sulfate in acidic conditions, three acids and one water. So in this reaction, you're looking at these two colorless solutions and they're forming molecular iodine. And there is a small amount of indicator in uh, the solution. So that way the iodine is very, very visible. It's a starch indicator. So it will tur turn a dark blue black color indicating the presence of molecular iodine. The main video reaction looks at the reaction between potassium iodate and sodium bisulfite. In the first trial, 50 milliliters of potassium iodate solution is reacted with 5 milliliters of sodium bisulfite solution. There's a delay in the reaction based on the kinetics of the two reactants. After some amount of time, the reaction will begin to show its products of iodine, forming a blue color. So as seen in the video, you're performing these rea this uh, reaction of the iodate and the bisulfite, and you're varying the concentration. You're not, set, uh, you're not changing it by a set uh, factor of two or factor of three. You're not doubling it or, or cutting it in half. You're changing it incrementally. And by doing it that way, you can look at any type of a change. It, didn't, it uh, doesn't have to be a specific factor, but look at a number of different changes and determine the reaction order graphically. So in the lab setting, you're going to be performing five different combinations and you'll do each one twice. So that way you can obtain uh, an average of, of the two measurements. The first one, uh, 50 milliliters of the iodate solution and five milliliters of the bisulfite solution. You're just measuring the time it takes for that dark blue uh, solution to appear.
Um, and then you're going to sequentially lower the concentration of just the iodate. That iodate concentration is lowering. The bisulfite concentration is staying the same. And by lowering the, the volume of iodate to maintain those uh, specific ratios of concentration, you're picking back up with volumes of water. So the total volume in every one of these solutions will be 55 milliliters. So when you do this, you're changing just the iodate and you can look at the uh, reaction order of iodate based on the reaction times. And you're going to do that through a graphical method. So the rate is equal to the, re, uh, the rate constant times the concentration of iodate raised to a power, that reaction order, times the concentration of bisulfite raised to a power, a reaction order. Since the bisulfite concentration is remaining the same through all of these different reactions, the, that means the concentration of bisulfite will remain a constant. So you're looking at the rate is equal to a constant. So that's the uh, concentration of iodate, or I'm sorry, concentration of bisulfite times the reaction uh, rate constant. So the rate is equal to a constant times the concentration of iodate raised to that power, that reaction order. And that's what you're going to be uh, trying to find. So in order to get this reaction order, you're measuring the time, not the rate. You're, you are measuring in a lab how long the reaction take, how many seconds does it take for the reaction to occur. And the rate and time are inversely proportional. So if the time is increasing, that means the rate is decreasing, slowing down. If the time was to double, that means the rate is cut in half. So the rate is equal to one divided by the time. And if you were to take the log of both sides of this equation, and using the properties of log, you would have the log of one minus the log of whatever that reaction time happens to be should equal the log of whatever this constant is plus the reaction order times the log of the iodate concentration. So by simplifying that down, you have the negative log of the reaction time equals some factor times the log of iodate plus a constant. Y equals mx plus b. So this format should give an absolutely straight line where the slope of that line is equal to the reaction order. So in this, you're going to be plotting the negative log of your reaction time on the y-axis and the log of the concentration of iodate on the x-axis. When you do that, you'll get, uh, you should get a straight line with a slope and an intercept. The intercept is just that, uh, that constant, but the slope is going to be the reaction order with respect to iodate. So looking at this, you it should look uh, something like this. Notice that in both cases, this is in the lower left quadrant of the Cartesian plane. These are both negative values. And when you prepare the graph, it doesn't necessarily matter if the, um, the axes values are on the side or if it's in the normal format, so long as they're, they're correct. You're going to be looking at this graph and preparing this graph and determining what is the slope 
of this straight line. The slope of that straight line is equal to the reaction order. So reaction orders themselves are whole numbers, a zeroth order reaction, a first order reaction, second order reaction. And these numbers that you're measuring in lab are, this is real data, you're using real numbers and real numbers are not perfect. So when you're in the lab setting and you're getting this slope of the line, you're going to be looking for what is the closest whole number. The reaction order will be the, the closest whole number, zero, one, two, three, to what the slope uh, actually is. Again, because you're using real numbers and real data that won't make a perfectly perfect straight line. So overall, in this experiment, you're doing a couple of different uh, reactions. You're looking at first the reduction of permanganate. You're taking 50 milliliters of sucrose and 10 milliliters of permanganate solution, measuring those uh, and measuring that reaction time. You'll selectively cut each one of these concentrations in half just one and not the other, and measure those two reaction times. And based on uh, those three, you can determine the reaction order for both the manganate ion and the sucrose. Next, you're going to be cutting the concentration of both of those solutions by a factor of 10. Um, and then using those now dilute solutions, you'll perform these reactions again. And that way you can look at the reaction orders of the permanganate ion and the sucrose for that first very fast step of the reduction reaction. In part B, you're looking at the iodine, uh, iodine clock. You're taking 50 milliliters of iodate and five milliliters of bisulfite, measuring that reaction time and performing it twice to obtain an average. And then you're selectively lowering the concentration of iodate, keeping the total volume the same uh, by adding water and looking at the reaction time. You're looking to see what is the reaction time as you progressively decrease the concentration of that iodate. So you're again, you're performing each one of these twice, so that way you can obtain an average, and then preparing a graph, a log plot, of the negative log of time on the y-axis versus the log of iodate concentration on the x-axis. And when you do that, the slope of the line the closest whole number to the slope of that line will be equal to the reaction order of the iodate. Overall, you're looking at a few different chemical reactions. You're looking at how concentration can affect them, whether it uh, speeds it up, slows it down, but also looking at the specifics of how it affects the reaction. Is it a first order reaction, a second order reaction, or even a zeroth order reaction where the concentration doesn't matter at all? You're looking at these reactions, you're timing them and figuring out how fast these reactions happen, how that relates to the concentration, and overall, what is the rate of these different chemical reactions?